In direct analogy with the concept of linear momentum, i.e. the quantity of motion associated with moving in a line, we define angular momentum. We use the symbol L, and L equals I omega. The choice of L is maybe a little bit problematic, but we're stuck with it. Why? Because we often have L's as lengths, and so sometimes you'll see it written with a lowercase l. Oops. Sometimes you'll see lengths written as lowercase l's. People get kind of contorted by this, and it's unfortunate, but we are very much stuck with it. All right, so L equals I omega. What are the units going to be? Well, the units of L will be the units of I, which is kilogram meter squared, times the units of omega, which are radians per second. So you can think of this as kilograms meters per second times meters. Um, or MVR. And we'll see a little bit later that that's not actually entirely crazy. We'll also, uh, not in this class, but if you take future science classes, you'll find that the units of uh, quantum mechanics and the Planck's constant turn out to also be kilogram meters per second times meters, which means that the units of quantum mechanics are angular momentum, and that's kind of weird and interesting, but not directly relevant today. That statement L equals I omega holds for any system or object that is spinning. But in the special case of a point particle, we can also extend this as L equals R perpendicular times P, where R perpendicular is the moment arm associated with the line of action of the linear momentum of that point particle. This is a little odd in that the object is not really moving angrily at all. It has a linear momentum. But we can compute mathematically the angular momentum about any point we choose. And it's strange, but it ends up being consistent with everything that follows, and we'll do some problems on it later to try and make it a little bit less unfamiliar. We can define impulse for angular motions in a way a like manner to that defined for linear for linear motions. Uh, here we use the Greek letter iota, which is like an I without its dot. Uh, so you might remember that we had impulse. Oops. was uh, the force times the time. I guess we used J actually. And we had this, so we're using, we're trying to get that out, and iota is sort of like an old school I. There was no J in ancient Greek, so there's no easy way to bring that over. Practically speaking, however, people don't really talk that much about angular impulse except to connect to angular momentum by saying the angular impulse is also the change in angular momentum, just like the impulse was the change in linear momentum. That allows us to say that dl dt is tau. That, in other words, torques cause changes in angular momentum. The rate at which angular momentum changes is the torque. Recall that if the net external force on a system happens to be zero, then the momentum is conserved. According to our analogy, it should follow that if the net external torque is zero, then the angular momentum is conserved. And this is true. If the sum of the external torques is zero, then L final equals L initial. It seems kind of simple, and it is, but conservation of angular momentum turns out to be one of the, most, the strongest analytic principles in physics. While it can be hard to isolate a system from all external forces, these forces often turn out to be so-called central forces. That is, they turn out to exert no net torque on the system. And this angular momentum is often conserved, and its conservation has important, important implications, even in cases where linear momentum is not conserved. Let's take one of those cases. Consider a person sitting on a chair free to spin. The person is holding her arm straight out on the side with some significant weight in each arm. Let someone else spin the person with some noticeable but low angular speed. Now the person on the chair brings her arms in towards her body. What happens? Here we run roughly the same demo. And you can see that as he brings his hands in, he speeds up. As he puts them out, he slows down. What I was demonstrating was the law of conservation of angular momentum. Now, that law says that the angular momentum of a system remains constant unless the system is acted upon by net external torque. Now, angular momentum is the product of an object's rotational inertia and its angular velocity. What I was doing by moving these masses in and out was changing the rotational inertia of my body. With the masses out, a fair amount of mass was distributed far from the axis of rotation, which was the vertical line passing through the center of my body and right through the stool. Um, when I brought the masses in, I decreased the rotational inertia. Now, the angular momentum is the product of the rotational inertia and the angular velocity, and that remains constant as long as we don't have a net external torque. So, at the beginning, I had a large rotational inertia, 
in a relatively small angular velocity. When I pulled my arms in, my rotational inertia went way down and my angular velocity went way up in order to keep the product of the two a constant. Now let's look at this again uh, with, with me holding two masses in each hand. This is going to give me a greater change in rotational inertia. They don't show you that somebody else has to get him going. But you can see the effect is much more dramatic because he has more mass that he's bringing in. There you can see that the changes in my angular velocity were greater because of the greater change in rotational inertia. Now we've been saying that uh, this, the law of conservation of angular momentum applies as long as no net external torque acts. In fact, there is a net external torque on the system. You can see because as the stool rotates, it will slow down because there's friction, which is a, exerting a torque on the axle. But this is small enough that you can still see the changes in angular velocity that are affected by the changes in rotational inertia. Uh, this is an effect that is used to good advantage by ice skaters um, in the high velocity spins that they achieve. They start their spin uh, fairly slowly, but then they bring their arms and legs in very tightly, and that makes them spin at a very high rate. Physicists love the ice skating ice skater uh, analogy here. We'll come back to it a lot of times. To sketch out what the uh, narrator was saying there, the person begins with some moment of inertia I naught and some speed omega naught. After bringing her arms in, she has moment of inertia I F and angular speed angular F. But crucially, the force she exerts to bring her arms in is internal and therefore cannot change the angular momentum of the system. So the original momentum, angular momentum, becomes the final momentum. So I naught omega naught is I F omega F. So omega F is I naught omega naught over I F, which we can say is omega F is the initial speed times some fraction, which is the ratio of moments of inertia. If she starts with her arms out and brings it in, then this number is bigger than this number, so omega F has to be bigger than omega naught. All right, what if instead of pulling the masses in, the person simply let go of them? Would we have the same effect? Would something be different? Give that a thought for a couple seconds, and then we'll have this guy conduct it for us. Again, what's going to happen here is he's going to simply drop the masses that he's holding. All right, here I am sitting on a stool, which is free to rotate, and I'm holding two heavy bean bags. In this experiment, I'm going to start myself rotating, and then I'm going to drop the bean bags at my side. The question is, what will happen to my speed? Will I spin faster, will I slow down, or will I spin at the same speed? All right, let's find out. So, as you can see, my speed did not change. This is because even though I lost some mass when I dropped the, the bags onto the tabletop, they carried away some of the angular momentum that I originally had. Therefore, even though I'm lighter, after I drop the bean bags, my rotational speed remained the same. All right, and again, this argument comes back to since the angular momentum has to be conserved and the person doesn't pick up any speed or lose any speed, it must be that the bags carry off some. So if we're looking from above, we would have something like here is the person spinning and at this moment, let's say, is when he lets go of the bag. So one's going this way and one's going this way. And they must have, because of this motion, they must be carrying some of the angular momentum of the system. And again, we'll see later, they are. This general fact that things spin faster as they get more compact shows up all over the place. It's how figure skaters do amazing spins, how NASA controls the orientation of the space telescope, and how stars and planets pick up their spin. Here's an illustration for figure skating. Right. So here are apparently three basic spins in figure skating. I don't know if that's true or not, but sure. Camel, sit, and upright. The skater spinning on a curve gives herself some angular momentum which then she turns into these other spins by stopping her linear momentum, but continue to rotate. We've looked at that one. That L can be R times uh, P. So as she decreases the radius, she increases her speed.
and we see how much faster she can go just by reducing her rotational inertia. Theoretically, we could get the ratio of her rotational inertia by the rotation of the angular sp spin, which is relatively easy to um, easy to measure. All right. So this has an interesting application, which the guys at Smarter Every Day went through, which is why do cats always land on their feet, which sounds like an old wives' tale, but turns out to be more or less true. Um, in the, I guess, 70s, someone actually did a, stu a study looking at all the injuries that cats falling out of windows in the Isle of Manhattan had, because the buildings in Manhattan are of all different heights, and they found that while cats falling out of low, uh, low buildings would suffer a variety of injuries, they would get less severe as the height get higher. And that's partly because the cats are able to basically orient themselves feet down and then sort of paraglide to the bottom. And the how they orient them, their way down is an interesting issue in physics, which this video is going to help show. Hey, it's me, Destin. Welcome back to Smarter Every Day. So you've probably observed that cats almost always land on their feet. Today's question is why? Like most simple questions, there's a very complex answer. For instance, let me reword this question. How does a cat go from feet up to feet down in a falling reference frame without violating the conservation of angular momentum? Now, I've studied free falling bodies, my own in fact, in several different environments, and once I get my angular rotation started in one direction, I can't stop it. Today, we're gonna use a high-speed camera. We're not gonna use Allie, because this is my daughter's cat. I don't wanna hurt it. We're gonna use a stunt cat. Let me introduce you to Gigi the stunt cat. I'll just flip the, uh, the video vertical and then motion track the cat. It's just going to take a lot more effort in post. We're going to try to do it in a way that doesn't make anybody mad. That's pretty hard to do. You got to drop a cat. Ready, Gigi? Good. Checking out the high speed data there, Gigi. Okay, the first thing a cat does when it's falling is try to figure out which way is up. It does this either with the gyro in the ear or with its eyes. <laughs> Ready to talk cat physics? All right, so check out this footage I captured with the Phantom Miro while Gigi goes to get a drink of water. So here's what's interesting about this to me. If you'll notice at the beginning of the drop, the cat is not rotating. Halfway through the drop, the cat is rotating, and then at the very end, Gigi somehow stops rotating. Newton's first law says that an object at rest will stay at rest unless acted on by an external force. I see no external forces on this cat. So what's happening here? It's not making sense to me. Okay, so in order to really get the right data, we're gonna have to drop her 90 degrees out of phase. Ready, girl? This time, watch her tail. Three, two, one. Okay, so you think you figured it out? Check this out. You probably noticed that when the cat was falling, her tail was rotating in the direction opposite of where her body was rotating. What's interesting about that is that that's not how it works. In fact, even bobtail cats can do this. It's called the cat riding reflex. I'll prove it to you. I came across some video from the 60s when the Air Force was researching microgravity for future astronauts. Turns out they took some cats up on parabolic flights. He tries to rotate his tail to flip over, but it doesn't work. He just ends up nutating wildly. 
Then he does something interesting. He takes his back and he bends it. And when he bends his back and then creates motion, something interesting happens. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So let me show you one more cat flip with the Miro and we'll figure this out. Okay, the arched back ends up being pretty important. Uh, what he does is he divides his body up into two separate rotational axes that are tilted from one another. When he's released, he pulls his front paws in and does the ice skater trick. He decreases his moment of inertia in the front so he can spin fast up there. But in the back, he pushes his legs away from him, increasing his moment of inertia. So a really large twist in the front equals a really small twist in the back in the opposite direction and the torques equal out. So as soon as he gets his front paws in under him, all he has to do is extend those legs back out to increase that moment of inertia and stop the front twist and extend his back legs along that rear axis. That allows him to twist those around really fast and then all he has to do is pull them back in under his body and then extend all four legs and brace for impact. So thank you for your attention. I hope you learned something pretty cool about cats. If you don't mind, woo! <laughs> okay, okay, I'm done, I'm done. If you would, go check out your other cat videos after trying to catch Gigi. Woo! A little too rowdy. If you'd like to, click Gigi the cat to subscribe. We'd appreciate it. I hope you had a good one. And uh, go get the ball. You gotta catch her first. I got it. You want it? Look. Very cool cat. She let us drop her hundreds of times. Or, you know, maybe just five. Want your ball? Go get it! Click her if you... Alright, so I hope that was either entertaining or illustrating or both. Demonstrating things can be difficult on Earth because the omnipresence of gravity gives you a preferred direction, which kind of mucks up things about conservation momentum and, ang and angular momentum. But we can go to space, so the following has been done on the space station to show how you can use conservation momentum around three separate axes to stabilize something. If you just give it a little push, it just sits there and tumbles end over end. It, it, it's not a very stable platform. Now we're going to turn it on and watch what happens. So this device is and just a CD, a CD player. And it's got a CD in there and it's going to spin up. So while it's spinning up, it starts to rotate the opposite direction. Then once it reaches steady state motion, it just sits there. And now look, when you push on it, it's uh, spin stabilized from a gyroscope inside uh, out of the compact disc. There's no good reason. It does have this nasty habit of oscillating like that if you push on it off axis. And we'll uh, see what happens here later trying to fix that. And there's a, another a CD player. We happen to have three of these on board. And you can see the one that's turned off just tumbles end over end. And I'll give this one a similar push. And it just sits there and, and uh, uh, holds its attitude. And it, it's amazing that a spinning CD uh, provides enough of uh, uh, enough stability to to uh, uh, show this kind of behavior. Now, being engineers up here and having three CD players with us, uh, you'll probably figure out what the next uh, thing is going to be. So now we've got a two-axis uh, gyroscopically stabilized platform here by taping two of these CDs together. And first, they're both in the off position, and we'll just show you what happens. It's, it, again, it acts like a solid body, and you just tap on a little bit outside uh, off-center from its center of gravity, and it tumbles end over end. Now, now these guys are turned on, and, and look what kind of stability we have. still oscillates a little bit, but it's more stable than uh, one CD player.
and you could still get these rather nasty oscillations uh, from the, the coupling of the moments from the two gyroscopes. And there's a demonstration of the, the third CD player that's turned off, and it just freely tumbles, and, and then we have the, the two that's taped together. And now, of course, since we had three of these fades, the next step is to tape all three of them together at 90 degrees. And again, with all of them turned off, uh, we'll see that it just tumbles end over end. Now we have all three of them turned on. And it makes for a more stable platform. It's still not quite as stable as I would like. Uh, however, uh, I'm, I'm not complaining because it's just uh, from a spin and CD. It still has uh, some of these little oscillations, as you can see, as you're pushing on it off axis from the, the, the CG of the, of the unit. And now the idea is, well, what did we use this for? And so figured, hey, let's see if we can save lots of flashlight with it. So you take one of our flashlights to the thing. And if you're careful about releasing it, you can actually keep the flashlight on the spot for a while. So it, it, you can kind of make it into a third hand here. Which isn't bad for three throwaway CD players. Try to release a, a, a something like a flashlight without this uh, uh, without this a stable platform added to it. It, it, it. It's really tough to release it without having some kind of a, a roll yard pitch moment. And now we're going to demonstrate uh, the utility of having this stabilized flashlight with using your CD player because you can listen to music, take your your uh, drill driver and your flashlight. And you can start doing repair work. You have to imagine they're not very excited about him just playing around with the drill there on the space station, but. And that's it for uh, Saturday morning science. So, obviously, NASA could definitely build more uh, accurate, stabilized platforms. But it's interesting that really just simple consumer tech is enough to make a very stable thing. This is used uh, more earthbound in stabilizing some of the drones that fly because they're they using their internal rotors or using the rotors that keep them flying by arranging the right way you can also stabilize the platform they make. Alright, one problem uh, just to get along with the idea of what this is talking about here. We have a low friction merry-go-round, a rotating platform with a radius of 1.5 meters and moment of inertia of 50 kilogram meter per square, rotating at 10 revs per minute. A child with mass 20 kilograms initially sits one meter from the center and then moves towards the outer end of the platform, and two students discover, discuss how to calculate the final angular momentum of the platform. Arno says, I think we have to use conservation angular momentum. The distance from the, uh, center, distance from the child to the axis of rotation increases, so the home moment of inertia increases, the total amount of total moment of inertia goes up, so the angular velocity has to go down. Whereas Bell says, I agree the angular velocity goes down, but I think you're going to get the wrong value. We need to use conservation energy because there is no collision here. The rotational kinetic energy is what's going to stay the same. As the moment of inertia increases, the angular velocity goes down. So Arno is saying we're going to go from that I naught omega naught equals I omega, IF, let's say, omega F. And Bell is saying that 1 half I omega naught omega naught squared is 1 half IF omega F squared. And so they both predict that Omega F will be less, but they predict by different values. Which one of them would you agree, or do you think neither is right? Here, it turns out to be Arno who's right, because the child exerts no external torque. If you consider the system to be the merry-ground and the child, as the child walks along the, the merry-ground, it's an internal force, not an external force, so it's an internal torque. So it can change the motion of the, the merry-ground, but only by conserving the angular momentum in the system. You can't really do energy conservation because there are sources of energy that aren't accounted for, for instance, the chemical potential in the child's body, to, in the muscles and so on.